Niger team is going to be presenting on stuff they've been doing for the past year. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened in the month of October. Um, so, first, I'm going to start off with a book review or a book recommendation. I read the Gene, or actually, I listened to the Gene. I don't read anymore. I do Audible. Um, I started with the Mukherjee, and it's amazing. It like takes you through like ancient Greek theories of inheritance to the discovery of evolution and, and daily genetics through like the rise of the eugenics movement and uh, the molecular biology revolution, the biotech revolution, the human genome project, and basically takes you up to the present day with CRISPR and like the, the, the most advanced sort of genomic diagnosis stuff. Uh, so really good book, highly recommend. Um, my favorite blog post from this month was uh, this one. I, I don't know how, how many people here saw Elon Musk's uh, sort of plan for going to Mars. All right, a few. Uh, Elon Musk presented a plan for going to Mars, and it didn't have any biotech in it. And so the uh, the biotech writer for the Motley Fool, which is a sort of investment website, um, wrote this blog post about how Elon Musk really needs to take biotechnologists with him in order to sort of develop sustainable agriculture uh, if you can change the systems of Mars in order to sort of toughen up humans for the uh, interstellar track, um, things like that. So very interesting read. Um, there were a couple of really nice profiles of famous synthetic biology people that I liked. Uh, the scientist interviewed uh, George Church, and uh, this new publication, Aussie, uh, interviewed Christina Smolke uh, of the uh, in Spain. Um, so those are really uh, sort of, if you want to learn what their childhoods were like, those are uh, good interviews to read. Um, Symbio Beta happened. Symbio Beta, a large sort of synthetic biology industry conference. Uh, I won't say too much about it because uh, there's a lot of writing online. Uh, my favorite sort of summaries of it were uh, Symbio Beta's own summary um, that sort of talked about the, the new companies that were debuted uh, and sort of the advances that were uh, talked about at the conference. And also, Aaron Dye of uh, the Plus Synthetic Biology Community had a really good. Um, uh, overview sort of the, the, the trends that he sees in the industry community um, based on the conference. Um, uh, the money for synthetic biology continues to rain down from the government. Um, in this case, it's the Department of Energy um, uh, going to spend $35 million to establish a consortium of advanced bio foundries for trying to solve problems with energy using microorganisms and things like that. Um, and the, big, the, the biggest one's going to be the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Um, so uh, there's a big, there are now like five giant bio foundries in, in the U.S. and like a bunch of them in California. Uh, so that's nice. Uh, in venture capital, um, things are, are, are really sort of continuing to be very hot. So last year, um, uh, synthetic biology companies raised over half a billion dollars. Um, and this year that trend is continuing. So like for, for instance, this month, Zymergen, which is uh, Silicon Valley's answer to Ginkgo Bioworks, raised $130 million. Um, and incidentally, I found out on my way to uh, present to you guys that uh, one of the founders and the chief science officer of Zy Zymergen is going to be coming and talking at Northwestern in like a week and a half. So go to that. That seems cool. Um, uh, also, IndieBio announced its fourth class. So IndieBio is the uh, first sort of synthetic biology focused uh, 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 startup incubator. Um, and there were a few uh, really interesting startups in there. Uh, one was like an open source um, liquid handler for making massively parallel experiments. Another one was trying to solve the uh, sort of snake anti venom shortage crisis using synthetic biology. So uh, it's very interesting. If you, if you want to work in synthetic biology in the future, the EDBio is a good place to follow. Um, and this uh, new VC for 50 years um, sort of there was a big uh, publicity push for it, and it is focused on meeting the UN's sustainable development goals in the next 50 years, and it's primarily focused on doing that with synthetic biology. So they've invested in a sort of large number of companies, mainly synthetic biology in the food uh, industry, um, uh, trying to replace sort of like meat and gelatin and various things like that. Um, so uh, very interesting uh, people to uh, keep an eye on. Uh, and also, Sam Altman, who runs Y Combinator, which is the largest and most successful startup accelerator, um, he was this big profile of him in the New York, New Yorker, and he, during that, in that profile, he mentioned that he's planning to sort of start an explicit synthetic biology division within Y Combinator in research. So there's just really a lot of um, uh, a lot of startup things happening in synthetic biology, um, and 
uh, sort of Jason Kelly, the CEO of Ginkgo Fireworks, has advice for some great biology startups, and that advice is uh, basically uh, be as specific as possible and then rely on the rest of the synthetic biology ecosystem to um, do things that you're not an expert in. Um, so basically, his argument in this piece of Collins and BioBeta is that the synthetic biology ecosystem has grown enough that you can, uh, anything that you're not sort of really, really good at, you can outsource to other companies, and that helps the synthetic biology ecosystem generally, and it makes you more efficient. Um, and they're sort of, Kinko Bioworks is sort of following that model. Um, they've now partnered with Amaris uh, this month, and Genomatica, and like one other, um, to sort of use their string engineering, and then partner with Amaris to do like massive scale up of uh, manufacturing biomolecules and things like that. Um, so, very interesting things there. Um, I would say a note of caution on the synthetic biology industry. Um, this of this uh, uh, perspective piece came out in Nature Biotechnology, where basically <coughs> pointing out that Amaris and Synthetic Genomics, which are two of the oldest synthetic biology companies, um, are now pivoting <coughs> away from their original goal of producing cheap biofuels and pivoting towards producing uh, biopharmaceuticals, which have much bigger margins. But it's also an acknowledgement that sort of cheap biofuels are not really something that we can attain right now. Um, so there's still a lot of work there to be done. Um, in sort of biosecurity, uh, Kevin Espel uh, had a profile in the MIT Tech Review, and uh, he floated this <coughs> idea, uh, I would say a controversial idea, of um, preventing uh, sort of unsafe research on gene drives by enforcing his patents on CRISPR gene drives. Um, and the, the review actually has this whole 20 minute uh, sort of interview with him that's uh, filmed, and it's a very interesting talk. Um, I would say it's not clear to me that sort of using the force of lawsuits is a good way to do biosecurity, but that's the thing he's thinking about doing right now. Um, moving on to the research papers, um, Pam Silver's lab uh, has developed a new synthetic little tiny bacterial micro compartment uh, in which you can do um, uh, basically metabolic engineering and you can concentrate the enzymes. So they took this sort of viral capsid protein um, and they attached um, these, uh, tag these tagging domains onto it and then uh, one onto the metabolic enzyme you want to put inside it and they basically self-assemble into these little particles and the little particles are very stable. They are stable at room temperature for like a week and they uh, increase the rate of sort of metabolite production by reducing the total distance that a metabolite has to travel to get to all of the enzymes. Um, and in sort of synthetic, uh, in genetic circuits, uh, you guys know probably the repress the repressilator, one of the first synthetic genetic circuits. Um, and the repressilator, or the repressilator here got an upgrade. And it actually wasn't an upgrade to the original architecture. So the architecture of the repressilator is like three repressors in sequence, and they repress each other, um, oh, oh, like, they take turns repressing each other over time, and then the concentration of GFP that gets expressed varies, kind of, the, the goal is sinusoidally. But originally, the uh, sort of behavior of the repressor leader wasn't really, uh, it was pretty stochastic, and uh, you didn't get good oscillations over long uh, time scale. But uh, what this group did was rather than try to change the genetic architecture here, they did a stochastic, and they did like a statistical analysis of the sources of noise in the repressor and they found that the problem was that uh, one of the repressors was being degraded too much, and one of them didn't have enough uh, sort of binding sites to titrate it away. And so once they uh, solved those problems in the uh, strain organism, you got uh, suddenly the original repressor behaving really, really well. You got like, synchronized oscillations. This is actually a single colony of E. coli, and the rings are the oscillations in the GFP expression. And you get this really, really nice uh, pattern. Uh, and it's sort of, these aren't uh, entrained or anything. There's no like uh, coupling signal between the single uh, between the single cells. It's just uh, cutting that, like making those two modifications to the cell itself to make the uh, circuit work behave much better. Um, so uh, finding useful enzymes to do a specific task from the sort of vast genomic databases is uh, sort of rate lending challenge in synthetic biology. And uh, this group, uh, sort of led by Martin Sommer, um, uh, sort of took a step towards solving that problem at least for uh, certain classes of enzymes. Basically, what they did was um, they mined uh, you know, metagenome databases for uh, uncharacterized bacterial transporters, and they built a little riboswitch-based uh, uh, sort of circuit where, in the presence of a, uh, an, a bacterial importer that imports a molecule of interest, in this case, it's thiamine pyrophosphate, 
the, thy the thymine pyrophosphate <coughs> binds to these two genes in sequence and activate them. And only in the presence of those two genes will bacteria be able to survive and grow. And so basically, any colonies you see here are colonies that have incorporated a functional importer of this small molecule. And they're able to do that to select for thymine pyrophosphate importers, and they're also able to do it to select for xanthine importers. So an interesting little selection scheme to discover some new and useful bacterial importers. Um, in CRISPR news, uh, the, the sort of application of CRISPR to the humans is uh, seeming more and more uh, uh, realistic. In this one, in this particular paper, they took uh, human hematopoietic stem cells that had the sickle cell uh, mutation, and they corrected them so that they no longer had the sickle cell mutation, and then they put them into mice to see if the hematopoietic stem cells would last. I imagine they're immune compromised to humanized mice that the uh, mouse immune system is in the hat. What they found was they were actually in vitro, they were having a pretty efficient homology directed repair with some of their guide RNAs up to like 50%. Um, and after like 16 weeks, they were able to see blood cells, not a lot, like 4%, 6%, 6 um, of the red blood cells were corrected and fixed in the mice. So, pretty cool. Um, in sort of metabolic engineering, uh, I've, I've sort of thought for a little while that the best way to do metabolic engineering would be in like uh, cyanobacteria because you know they just grow on sunlight and CO2 and uh, you don't need uh, sugar and things like that. Um, and so this group has actually demonstrated um, the synthesis of amorphine, which is the uh, malaria precursor that Jay Kiesling's group just, just uh, first got famous for for uh, expressing in yeast. Um, and they also did squalene, uh, which is another complex molecule. So I think this is the most complex uh, metabolic engineering that's ever been successfully attempted in the cyanobacteria. I think it's like six to nine genes in the pathway. Uh, and they were able to produce milligrams per liter, 20 milligrams per liter of amorphodiene. Now, and finally this month, uh, there, was, uh, there were a few familiar faces that I saw while I was crawling across the web. Um, uh, Cold Spring Harbor published a perspective on cell-free synthetic biology uh, written by Jessica Perez, Jessica Stark, and Mike Jewett. Um, and uh, ACS Synthetic Biology published a paper on sort of improved modeling of how uh, genomic, the, the site of a genomic integration of a gene affects um, gene expression in E. coli under a variety of conditions. And that came uh, from Andrew Scarpelli, Andrew Younger, and Gus Lundgren. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, another uh, Northwestern professor, not strictly speaking synthetic biology, but um, uh, uh, Shaw Lab developed this, um, this hydrogel, which has a lot of hydroxy appetite in it, that you can 3D print. And uh, once you 3D print it and put it into like an organism, bone will grow very efficiently into that gel. And so it's a good way of doing bone regeneration. And I kind of wonder if it would be a good way of sort of growing shapes out of bone. Uh, so that's all the news for me. Uh, and now uh, Joe's going to introduce the item.